Good afternoon, one and all. Let me check my sound is going. It is fantastic. We had a little incident yesterday where it wasn't working, so that was interesting. Marta and I, we're both here. Say hello, hello. Marta. Hello. Thank we you. literally <laughs> about thirty seconds ago finished the OCR A level P paper two session, so it's been a bit manic actually. To be, we went a bit long there, um, but lots to fill in. So lots to fit in. So we're really happy with that. How that session was. We got another one now. No idea how I'm going to get my head down and teach for an hour and a half here, but I'm going to do it anyway. So let's see how it goes. Marta, we want to remind these folks they can engage with us, and we urge them to do so. They can chat with us live on the live chat we've got some good messages on the last one some great questions um that's on the hub page okay we haven't enabled live chat i think you probably know why on youtube i mean uh but we've got a uh, live chat a uh, direct chat on, if you want to ask questions on the hub page so that's in the youtube description if you want to go and do that um secondly folks we really urge you to have your notes pages with you ideally also your exam infographics your national mock exam your mark scheme for that and your model answers those are the resources we want you to use to prepare for that paper too okay i know paperwork one seems very recent it was yesterday i get it you know um but let's put that work in and make sure we get that preparation right for uh, for paper two it's a biggie right um folks can i please ask a favor please hit like on the video um it really does make a difference for us and do consider offering a, a subscribe to the youtube channel we're trying to get to twelve thousand subscribers any anything you can do to support us allows us to do this stuff more and support people and we're really looking to do things with our youtube channel so the more you can do that the more we benefit just on that sort of like community sense so thank you very much in advance uh, for doing that we answer every sensible comment on the youtube comments as well so feel free if you're watching on demand to post a comment i try i've been doing a lot of technical p answers recently uh, so feel free to ask on that one and i think that might be it marta anything before we get going no Okay, Let's we, get going. we anticipate this session being around about 110 to 120, 1 hour 10, 1 hour 20, and that'll leave us a little bit of time for q and at the end or shout outs, that sort of thing. Do post your questions. I do genuinely appreciate them, folks. So, unless we have uh, anything else to say, Marta, I've got my headphones on, nope. me digital pens ready to go. I'm going to try and keep my wrist going. It's like literally like writing an exam for you guys. You know what I mean, right? Let's see if we can do this. AQA, paper two, tons of material. Let's go. This is a bit as nervous, like just the changing over the streams. Hang on a sec. Here we go. Right then, my little cherubs. Let's go. let's get on with this. <laughs> okay, we are doing AQA level PE paper two. Folks, can I remind you? You should, when taking the session, have your notes pages available. They're in the YouTube description, the hub page just below. If you're on the hub page, they're on there. Just download them. You need to put your email, nothing. Just download them. Ideally, as well, you'll have the exam infographic to notice the nature of the exam. Lots of 8s and 15s, lots of analysing and evaluating, as you know. Um, I've written a national mock exam paper, mark scheme, and model answers. Now, with that in mind, folks, if I just squeeze past my performance for a second, this material here was everything that was on the national mock exam is in the model answers, in the mock schemes, etc. And of course, what I'm doing today is I'm selecting out certain material to cover in this particular, oh my God, I've selected a lot, but this particular session, okay? So we're gonna look at this particular session this way. Now, can I stress to you folks that I am not covering acute injury, I'm not covering motivation, I'm not covering NGB, stress management types of goals, but the mock exam does that, the mock schemes do that. And of course, there's other material beyond this too. And finally, before we get stuck into this, can I remind you of our performer one, our performer two, our performer three, four, five, six below? All right, we're going to use these as the nutrition of our AO2 making examples, okay? And what I mean by that is, you know, we've got Josh here who's a maximal performer, for example. We've got Tom who's a recreational, often sub-maximal performer. He's doing games play. He's doing open skills. This is a closed skill. We can apply this to different environments, and I'll try and remember to do that throughout the session. With all that in mind, folks, let's make a start. You will notice that in section one, my objective is to work on fart leg training. Should you get a question on fart leg training, basically... And of course, that fartlek training is for that cardiovascular endurance, aerobic, aerobic power, aerobic capacity. But you'll notice as well, I've also provided two other types of training because this is excellent for comparative structures. So we could either be analyzing these sort of fitness uh, training methods um, for aerobic development. I'm talking about all three. We could be asked to compare fartlek and continuous, look at one question on fartlek and one question on here, etc., etc. That's why I present it this way. So let's look at fartlek first to the right here. And of course, we are going to make sure that we can evaluate stuff. So by the way, I know my screen flickers slightly. Every time I put my hand on my media tablet, it's sort of affecting the screen. I'm, nothing I can do. I hope it's not affecting you. So what is fartlek? It is continuous training, first of all. So this and this are both continuous forms of training. But what we do is we vary the intensity, incline, and terrain, okay? Now with intensity, this is really, we will be either doing sprinting, 
pace running, let's call it jogging or steady state running, or walking. We never have rest. There are no stops. Okay, there are no stops. Otherwise, it's interval training, right? So what's good about this method? Of course, we do hills. We do cross-country work. But what's good about this? Brilliant for game players. Brilliant for cross-country runners because you've got this changing intensity all the time. You've got more varied. Therefore, it makes it more interesting. And this is crucial. Unlike continuous training, it helps to maintain speed as well as our aerobic power, our CV endurance. However, there are negatives because we're evaluating. It is more technical, so it just takes more thought, you know. It just takes a bit more planning, I suppose, and it's harder to monitor intensity. So we might not be able to say, look, right now she, he is working. Let's say it's uh, uh, Kate, our triathlete. She's working at 82% of max heart rate because we don't know that because the intensity is changing all the time, right? So it's harder to monitor that. Now, let's make a comparison with that and continuous training. So what is continuous training? It's periods of steady state exercise. You that term a minute ago. Try and get it in your answers. It must be a minimum of 20 minutes. It can be up to two hours. And typically, it's 60 to 80% heart rate max. Can I just say that some people argue it's 60 to 85% max HR. The guidance I'm giving you is 80, but don't be shocked if you see that in a in a question, in a table, that kind of thing. You know, sometimes it's presented that way. Now, what are the positives of continuous training? Well, look, it's simple because we run, we walk, we cycle, we cross train. Simplicity. Everyone can do it, and it's effective at increasing aerobic capacity. So it actually works. Okay, so that's great, beautiful. Why would we not do it then? Well, look, you could probably tell me. I, I've done a lot of running in my time, but it's pretty tedious. It can take forever. Think about cycling. You have to put all the gear on. You have to clean your bike and your mechanisms. You have to you have to get your helmet on. You have to get your gloves. You have to wear the right stuff for the weather. You get out there. You got to put your tires up. They get back. Clean your bike. Now, that's a whole to do in it. <laughs> it's a whole to do to put on your exam. Continuous training is a whole to do. Um, it's a little bit to do. <laughs> Said it again. And it's thought to restrict speed possibly. Develop CV endurance, but maybe speed. And it sometimes can develop chronic injuries. Think about stress fractures, shin splints, this sort of thing. We've also got HIIT, high intensity interval training, which, yes, it is anaerobic work, but it is aerobic recovery. So it's periods of high intensity work and recovery. Now, it's this recovery, which is the aerobic bit. Our aerobic systems have to really work hard to get the recovery in. It can be as short as 20 minutes, but less than up to an hour. We expect about four to 10 sets of 10 reps, running site cross training, and our work relief ratio, this is the key number here, two to one. We do double the work to the recovery period, okay? So the recoveries are short, therefore that aerobic system really has to work hard to gear us back up. Notice we sometimes say it one to 0.5, but two to one is a more convenient way of doing that. Why is HIT good for aerobic work? Brilliant for calorie consumption, it, it burns basically. Faster adaptations, we get uh, fitter quicker. Performers build intensity into their performance. Look, look, that intensity is in most performances, even if they're steady state performances. Quicker sessions compared. So it's, it's, it's sort of more, we could say the word convenient here, couldn't we? Convenient. Athletes of differing levels can train together. That's a beautiful point, you know, because you're doing HIIT training, not everyone has to be at the same uh, point on the road, like continuous, for example, and you get fewer overuse injuries. However, it, it's real big on motivation. Uh, technique is sometimes lost at higher intensities. So what we are now prepared to do is evaluate any one of those three methodologies, but we can also make comparisons. We can also start applying them to different athletes. Can we see, for example, fartlek would be really relevant for games players, for example. Now, folks, I'm going to skim us down to recovery methods. Okay, I'm just trying to find my place in my notes. Bear with me, please. Recovery methods. Here we go. So I want you to be thinking about five recovery methods here. So first of all, and we're going to write cryotherapy in, by the way, compression garments, what are they? They're things like tights. They're things like uh, restricted um, uh, uh, pressure-based tops. What do they do? They increase our venous return. This is the amount of blood returning to our right atrium um, off in the diastolic phase. So it's actually helping that skeletal muscle pump squeeze back. It relates to Starling's law. Of course, if we get more venous return, we get more stroke volume out. Fantastic. And greater venous return means greater stroke volume, which means faster recovery. That's why we use compression garments. So if you can be bothered to afford them, you can spend 80 quid on a pair of compression leggings if you want. And you can sit at home watching your telly in your cocoa pops and you can recover faster with better venous return. I know I've got a couple of friends who do it and the money they spend on it is ridiculous. I, I personally, the impact's not enough for me to consider it. And I'm anyway, I'm not going into it. Massage foam, foam roll is why. First of all, it helps. This is manipulation of muscle, right? So prevention of DOMS, removal of toxins, reduced tightness in the muscle and that knotting. 
and it basically means we can train and compete sooner. So we have got Laura the gymnast. She has a massage after a training session. Why? Because she can train again more effectively tomorrow. That's why she's doing it. Cold therapy. What does it do? It brings blood into the core of the body. It pushes it away from the external tissue, such as the muscle and the skin. And it decreases swelling and inflammation. Okay, so it's really important. It helps us to sleep better. It's improved immunity and get better focus. Now, can I just stress? I talked about the blood. You know, here, here's my person here's my athlete wow so when we go into the cold therapy let's say it's an ice bath an example it pushes the blood into the center of the body and then when we come out of the ice bath the blood then returns back out through the legs through the arms and so on and what's happening there is flushing back through now ice baths exactly what i've just said capillary flushing prevent doms now cryotherapy folks we want to make sure we've got a, a good understanding of this so let's put some notes in here we are talking about extreme cold and the exposure to extreme colds. Let's be clear, it's much colder than an ice bath. We could be talking about minus 170 degrees Celsius. Woo! Okay, that's pretty a pretty cold. Um, so what's the step? So step one, you go into a climatization, a climatization chamber. That's what we do first. You go into a climatization chamber, which is cold, but not that cold. And it's um, and you're gonna go. You're then gonna go in from there. You're gonna go into the main uh, cryotherapy uh, chamber, which is gonna be at this temperature. But you are gonna be in there for less than 60 seconds. So you're gonna be in there for a very small period of time. Why would we do it? Why is it positive? It's brilliant for capillary flushing. So I'm putting it in green. Brilliant for flushing the capillaries with oxygenated blood once you come out. We get down arrow decreased exercise induced muscle damage. Okay, so it helps to reduce swelling, induced muscle damage. So it helps to sort of reduce the, the impact of little micro tears and what have you. Also, it's very good for down arrow reducing DOMS, so less stiffness uh, after training, so we can train again a few, sooner and we get fewer injuries. So cryotherapy, damn expensive, really impractical, often not available in most scenarios but it's pretty effective. Now I'm just gonna pause there briefly just to sip my tea and I'll be straight back to you. Don't know if you can hear in the background, someone's just turned on a generator near me, it's humming away, I hope it's not bothering you. Factors, effects and stability, so we're moving into that biomechanical movement. We've got the concept of center of mass and we're gonna link it to stability, okay? So first of all, let's define. Center of mass is the point in the body where mass is distributed evenly in all directions. Now if this was a shot, uh, if this was a shot from shot putting or a discus from discus throwing, that's easy. The center of mass is in the middle, right? So it's all dis even distribution. But we're often talking about human beings. Now, one of the things to realize about human beings is just where the center of mass would be. If we take, let's just put me little stick fella in again, okay? This one is going to have their center of mass about there in their navel, okay? Navel with an E, by the way, navel. Now, we are able to manipulate that central mass. We can move it up, we can move it outwards, we can move it back behind us, and we do that by moving our body. So I want you to look at this surfer here. If normally it's in the navel, this person has crouched, put their knees forward, we're going to argue that their central mass is still fairly central, but it might now be here in point A. You could even argue point B. What about this runner? This runner, uh, rather than having their arms down, they've raised this arm, they've raised this They've also raised this leg up. So we're gonna argue now, and that, that leg has come forward, we're gonna argue now that their center of mass is raised higher in his, uh, let me go a different color, is around about here, okay? And it's gone forward because that leg has gone forward as well. This body here with our weightlifter, we're gonna assume that the bar and the man weigh approximately the same. I'm not saying they do, I have no idea. But let's assume that they do just for the purposes of this. That whole body now is a single object. Where is the center of mass? Well, normally it would be in D, right? The center of mass around about the navel of the athlete. But now, if you were to put where the mass is distributed evenly, my goodness me, it's there at A. Actually, in between, in midair is the center of mass. Wow. And this one, I, I've always wanted this uh, performance to be a bit more arced. But if we look at this, our performer is in that shape with their head here, feet here, legs here. Notice now the center of mass, even though they are traveling over the bar, we could argue their center of mass is below the bar. They've manipulated it. The Fosbury flop is a genius technique because only one part of the body at any time is passing over the bar. Think about that. Therefore, the center of mass 
can pass under the bar, law of conservation momentum, flight path of the center of mass of a heavy object is predetermined, the takeoff, etc., etc. But if we position our body above the center of mass at any point that's crossing the bar, then we can pass, the, we can cross the bar even though the center of mass doesn't. Now, what we want to do, folks, is we want to now look at the factors affecting uh, stability. So this is what we're interested. In, okay. So first of all, we're now we're going to look at height of center of mass. Okay, center of mass. So here's the first one. If we have got high, this equals less stable. So something which is tall, upright, elongated. Think about a handstand. This is a very long object and it's relatively unstable. If we think about low height, it's more stable. Okay, so if we want to tuck, crouch, if we want to sort of get nice and low to be solid and stable, that's going to help for us, right? Think about our tennis player, Tom, and he's ready positioned to receive the serve. He gets nice and low, so he's nice and stable. We've also got the notion of mass. Okay, so with mass, now basically what we're saying here with mass is that if we've got more mass, you know, effectively heavier, this equals more stable. So think about a prop forward or front row uh, rugby player. If we've got less mass, think about, I don't know, a back in rugby, This is they're gonna be less stable. In other words, easier to bring to the ground. Okay, let's take it further. Why don't we go and have uh, a look now at the base of support? Base of support. And there's a few points to make here, actually. So first of all, the greater the base equals more stable and the lesser the base you know the smaller the base area is the less stable so think about the difference between a headstand and a handstand for a gymnast a, hand, a headstand is much more stable because it's got a larger base to it we can also say that a headstand has got three points of contact with the ground whereas a handstand's only got two therefore the base is greater and that's the point i want to uh, make we've also got points of contact okay so more points of contact more stable less points of contact less stable think about a rock climber if you're on the rock if you're on a rock face and you had right arm left arm right leg left leg on grips or in a particular moment you'd be quite stable right but what if i'm going to reach up with both arms and step with one leg i've now only got one point of contact with the wall and I'm now much less stable. And then finally, folks, we've got what we refer to as line of gravity. And this really becomes important uh, around rotational mechanics, but line of gravity. And what we're saying here is if above base, so if the line of gravity above base, this person is going to be stable. If not, not stable. Now, we often hear the word stable and we think, right, we, we want to be stable in sport, right? We want, no, sometimes we want to be unstable. A sprinter leaving the block, they want to be unstable. So they put their line of gravity in front of where their feet are because they're accelerating forwards. It's controlled acceleration, but that's what we're trying to get to. So Josh, he would have his line of gravity at his sprint start in front of his base of support, his feet or foot, and that would propel him forward. It's almost like controlled falling forward. Whereas once he's upright and sprinting, he wants his centre of mass, his line of gravity above his base. Okay, now then, we're moving on to mechanical advantage here and disadvantage. Okay, so first things first. Um, let me just find my note. Bear with me a second. Bear with me a second. I thought I had my notes. Where have they gone? Uh, okay, so let, let's do it like this. So first of all, in essence, folks, I'll, I'll come back to this image in a second. In effort, in essence, mechanical advantage is this. It is the effort arm, and that is uh, divided by the load arm. So let's first of all make sure we understand what an effort arm is. This distance here, let me choose a darker color. This distance here, this is the insertion in this case of the gastrocnemius onto the calcaneus, the heel bone. That distance there to the center of the fulcrum, this is the effort arm. So let's imagine for this person that is 10 centimeters. Okay, that's 10 centimeters. So let's just assume that it might be a bit longer, but let's just assume that's 10 centimeters. But then what we've got is we have got what's called a load arm. And that load arm is, <laughs> let me redo that. That load arm is this distance here. So let's imagine that is, I mean, it's not a very good calculus, but let's imagine that's five centimeters. So if we divided 10 by five, what do we get? We get two. So we've got a mechanical advantage of two. It's twice as efficient. It's able to produce twice as much turning impact. We call it torque than if um, there was no mechanical advantage. So 
This, in other words, folks, if we go back to mechanical advantage here, we've got a longer effort arm, a shorter load or resistance arm, and a person could overcome heavy weights, weight-bearing exercise with relatively, with relatively little effort. Now, the impact of this is, yes, you can do lots of force, but it's not got a wide range of movement and it does not move fast. And that is why mechanical advantage is, is important because if we look here, look, folks, what we've got in this situation, obviously, is that oh, I actually had my measurements in there. We still come up with an answer of two, by the way. Um, but we've got our measurements in there. But what if we look at a different kind of lever? Okay. All of a sudden, let's look at our first class lever of elbow extension. This is a person extend the elbow. Notice on this one, my effort arm is super short and my load or resistance arm is long. So what do we get here? We get disadvantage, which sounds terrible, doesn't it? Oh my God, we're disadvantaged. But what we're saying here is that this person with this elbow extension can do what? They can do the following. Short effort arm, longer load arm, increased range of motion, speed of contraction, decreased load. So we're not able to really like shuffle the big things. And by the way, when you do tricep work, in the gym, you might notice that the, 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 the irons you're lifting are not that many because it's not a very efficient advantage lever. But the point is this can now move with things like speed, with things like flexibility and wide range of motion. So there's different advantages. And I'll allow you to go and look at these. I mean, this, this one's exactly what we did at the start. And the third class lever, let's, let's do it. Look, here we've got our effort arm, which is, you know, not super long. And here we've got our load arm. So again, can you see that this is mechanically disadvantaged? Uh, again, as we said before, we've got a longer load arm than effort arm. It's going to be better for flexibility and speed than it is for strength. That's what we mean by mechanical advantage and disadvantage. Super quick break and I'll be straight back to you. Oh yeah, one of my favourite all-time topics in, well, P teaching biomechanics specifically. I bet you don't even have a favourite biomechanics topic, do you? Puh. Okay, here's one of mine, impulse. Let's just make sure we understand what we're talking about. We are talking about the condition of changing momentum. Now, if you want to get technical, you probably know that momentum is mass times velocity. So we are looking at changing that momentum great. In other words, we change velocity because normally mass stays the same. So we are changing momentum. So impulse equals a change in momentum. So greater impulse equals a greater change in momentum. That's what we're talking about. And we use it in two scenarios. We use, we use it when we want to accelerate a body. You know, you can link this to Newton's second law, of course. The body will accelerate proportional to the force acting in the direction of that force. But we also do it when we want to decelerate. Decelerate. I always struggle with that spelling. A body. Okay, so this is about acceleration and deceleration. Why? Because we are changing momentum. Remember that momentum is mass times velocity. Velocity stays the same. So, of course... If we're changing momentum, we are changing velocity. That is either acceleration or deceleration. I hope that makes sense. Our unit is as follows. It is impulse equals the force applied multiplied by the time it is applied for. So literally, it is force multiplied by time. That's what this is. So let's have that nice and clear. How do we represent it and why is it important? Well, let's have a look at this curve, right? First of all, can I just stress the units? We've got force in newtons. That will be pretty familiar to you. But notice our time is not in seconds. This is milliseconds. Okay, so this is in tenths of seconds. So what we're seeing here is that skill A is performed in effectively 15... Um, in yeah in in 1.5 milliseconds so it's effectively 15 percent of a second let's put it that way okay that's what we're talking about one uh, there we go so uh, skill b is performed in two milliseconds or 20 percent of a second okay so what we're saying here is what's the impact of this so i'm going to imagine that this is a hockey player Okay, and I'm going to imagine, uh, should I do a hockey player? No, let's do tennis, because I've got Tom up the top. This is Tom, my tennis player, Tom, and he's playing a forehand stroke. And uh, performer A, I'll put it into green here, performance A is with no follow-through. And um, performer B is with follow-through. Okay, so that's what we mean with those so he's hitting a ground stroke forehand and the first one's no follow through second one is so notice what happens with no follow through remember no follow through will mean the t is lower meaning the impulse is lower what do we get well first of all you'll notice that the time period 
that the racket head, the strings are in contact with the ball is short or shorter. And you'll also notice that the total force output, 300 newtons in this case, is lower than what we're going to come up to. So what we're getting here is less change in momentum. Okay, so in other words, this ball is going to travel. It's going to check, it's going to accelerate, but it's not going to accelerate to the level that it could. So if we now ap apply a follow through, what happens? Well, notice the racket head, the strings are now in contact with the ball for longer. In other words, what we've done is we've taken T and we've shifted that up. And not only will that increase things like accuracy, but notice what happens here, folks. It increases the peak force point okay now we could actually measure all of the force under that graph i'm not going to do it but we could actually measure all of the force applied there um but what we're interested in here is that by applying a follow-through we increase the total force output which of course increases impulse that of course means a greater change in momentum that of course because the tennis ball remains the same mass mass times velocity is momentum that means that it accelerates further and perhaps wins as the point by being a clean winner or a first serve or whatever it happens to be okay and it's more accurate because of course newton's second law the follow-through is in the direction that you want the ball to go we know that now the other thing folks i mentioned deceleration Imagine, I've been watching IPL cricket recently, imagine a cricket ball has been absolutely smashed into the air and it's gone up like at some mad rate and it's coming down, it's coming down. This ball is travelling fast. And I've got a little fella down here, Neville, a little Neville down here and Neville's looking up at this ball and he's got to put his hands out to, to catch it and this ball is coming down at him like a rate of knots. How would he do that? Well, he'd place his hands high and then as the ball struck, he would lower, 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 lower. He'd bring the ball into his chest and cushion the ball. He wouldn't just keep his arms out straight, would he? Ball hits him, bang, it bounces out. So what he's doing there is he's decreasing, he's decreasing momentum over longer time. In other words, by the way, this is really good for any eccentric contraction work. Decreasing momentum over time, over a longer time, so he decelerates for longer. Okay, he applies force for longer. That's what we mean by impulse. Now, I'm going to show you one other thing, but I've got to change canvas first. One second, please. Now, one of the impulse skills I would encourage you to have is to look at something where we might be looking at, a, let's say, a skill of a vertical jump. So, let's imagine... Um, let's imagine that this is Julie on netball play from our examples and she's jumping to take a high catch in the D or, or she's had a ball that's been lobbed and um, she's having to catch it overhead, something like that. It's a vertical jump, right? So what can we see here? Well, you'll notice that here there's no impulse, right? This is at zero. This is her effectively standing still. All net forces are zero or net forces zero. Now what's happened first? In order for her to jump, she has to do what you might call a negative uh, acceleration. She's got to actually move downwards. So this here is her bending... Her her knees and as she's bending those knees this is the point now where she starts to go back upwards so this is her pushing off the ground she reaches peak force but notice she pushes off the ground right until the time that her toes her little pinky leaves the court surface and that's that point there and what this will cause because she's now got this great if you see here she's now got this greater time period of the force application what we're now going to get plus the elastic nature of the muscle we're now going to get a greater vertical could be horizontal depending on the skill distance traveled in other words folks she's going to jump higher and catch the ball above her opponent allowing her to pass the ball into the d and a goal will be scored or whatever the impact is my example uh, impact outcome eio method of making examples so that's really important but can i just re-stress that point this is the moment here her little pinkies leave the ground this is the moment here that she starts stops moving downwards and starts moving upwards at the base of her sort of up now this is where she's at her lowest point height wise because she's in the crouch this is when she's sort of flat footed on the ground before she does it this is where she's got peak force and of course we could take that reading of peak force as well okay brilliant let's move things on uh, we're now moving on to Newton's laws of angular motion, okay? And these Newton's analogs, I, I found so commonly that students confuse these, so I'm, I'm going to take a few moments with them. First of all, on the first analog, you relate it to Newton's laws, but try to distinguish them, please, folks. It really is important that you do. Newton states, a rotating body, that's all we're interested in here, will continue in a state of constant angular momentum. Remember, angular momentum is angular velocity times moment of inertia. 
until acted upon by an external torque. We need that word. If you're not sure what a torque is, <laughs> first of all, it doesn't have a G in it. A torque is a force times what we call perpendicular distance. Okay, and I'll show you a bit more about that. But it's not simply a force. If you want to relate that back to your um, effort arm, that is literally the output of an effort arm. Okay, so what would be an example? A body in flight, let's say it's a um, high diver doing a tuck somersault, will rotate with constant angular momentum until landing, till they enter the water and the water applies an external torque. Um, an ice skater performing a salco, uh, no, performing a spin, will rotate with constant angular momentum until they place their other foot back down the ice and apply an external torque. That is what Newton's first analog is. It's very similar to the law of motion, but it's related to rotating bodies rather than uh, constant velocity moving body and it's a oh, stationary body and it's relating to specifically folks it's relating to torques not forces torques produce circles newton's second analog angular acceleration is directly proportional to the torque acting just as the linear acceleration is uh, proportional to the force and takes place in the direction now can i stress there are only two directions there's clockwise or there's anti-clockwise, or I guess you can say counterclockwise, I suppose. Clockwise or counterclockwise, they're the two directions. And then in his third analog, for every rotational action, there is an equal and an opposite rotational action. I'll show you that in a few moments' time, okay? All right, so there's our analog. So what we want to do is look at our definitions of angular motion quickly. So first of all, we must know our definitions and units. So let's remind ourselves, and I'm going to prove this first one to you in a second. Angular momentum is the quantity of rotation a body possesses. And we define it as moment of inertia times angular velocity. And these are inversely proportionate, more of which in a second. Now, angular velocity, folks, theoretically could be asked to measure, I suppose. But it is the rate of rotational motion around an axis of rotation. So there's our definition. And we define, ang are we able to calculate angular velocity by angular momentum over moment of inertia. Okay. So effectively, we've taken this and restructured it. An angular acceleration is change of rate of angular velocity. So we take effectively change um, change angular velocity over time. Final angular velocity minus initial angular velocity divided by time. And I had a question about this. When we write this format here, this is rads per second per second or rad squared. This does not equal divide in this context. Okay, just to be clear on that. This equals per, per, per. Rads per second per second or rads per second squared. Okay, you, that is the same as saying rads per second squared. It's exactly the same principle. Okay, that's the same thing. All right, now then, we want to know our axes of rotation because, of course, these are uh, relevant for us. So, oh, well, specifically, we want to know uh, movement around these, these axes. Okay, so first of all, recognize, for example, that this here, what we would call, call call our transverse axis, notice here that if we were to twist this axis in either direction, okay, this person would sort of spin, and they'd spin, up, obviously, as we know, uh, around the transverse axis along the sagittal plane. But I want you to realize as well that we have a transverse axis here, 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 in the wrist, in the wrist, here, in the knee. In other words, if that knee flexes, that is rotation around the transverse axis of the knee. Now, our longitudinal or vertical axis we've got here, longitudinal, of course, if we were to rotate this this way or this way, this person is going to effectively twist, okay? And we really, I mean, we do technically have more than one longitudinal axis. You might be able to recognize, for example, we have one through our arm. You can kind of twist that to an extent. We have one through our leg and you can kind of twist that. But... These longitudinal axes involve twists, change of directions, pivots, but this is angular motion. And then finally, guys, with our sagittal axis, sometimes called a frontal axis or even anterior posterior, but sagittal axis, again, if we were to rotate this in this direction or we were to rotate this in this direction and it was attached to this person, this person is going to do their cartwheel, their diving save, their aerial, right? That's what they're going to be doing. But again, notice that we have a sagittal axis in that shoulder. What would, if, if we rotated this, what would happen? This person's arm would do this, right? They'd abduct that arm. So just be aware of those considerations. We often consider this one, this one, 
and this one is the primary axes. They're representative, summative. We just want to make sure that these are joint specific as well. Now, let's take this further and have a look at angular momentum. Now, I've got so much to say about this that I'm going to have to choose my words carefully. This is one of my literal favorite units of study. I've spent a lot of time studying this. I'm going to try and keep it at the right level here. Okay, so first things first. The axes aren't even labeled. Anyway, this is what we're saying. Notice there are three values on this graph. Not two, not one, three. We have angular momentum. Now, of course, when we are doing something, let's say it's a high dive. Let's say we're doing a high dive in, you know, like the swimming pool diving. Of course, what we want to happen is at the point of letting go of the platform or the board, we want our angular momentum to be high. So, of course, we want this point to be as high up this y-axis as possible. So we want high angular momentum. Now, if we go back to what we said before, that angular momentum equals moment of inertia times angular velocity, how do we do that? Because when we're still on the platform, here I am, here's the platform, here's Neville, absolutely useless Neville is, hang on, here's Neville, he's still on the platform, he's about to dive, there he is, he's about to set off. How does he maximise angular momentum at the point of takeoff? And of course, the only ways he can do it are either to increase this or to increase this at the point of takeoff. Now, he can't increase angular velocity because he ain't turning yet. So all he can do is make his moment of inertia high. How do we increase moment of inertia? Well, if you remember, he's about to rotate around his transverse axis of his hip. So what this person will do, Neville, he'll put his arms up in the air and he will point his toes. In other words, he's moving his mass away from that axis. Okay, what does that do? That gives a greater moment of inertia, and yes, angular velocity is very, very low. But now, if I'd have if I'd have not stretched those arms up, my peak angular uh, momentum would be lower. It would be in here somewhere, okay? But we've got it nice and high. Now, as he takes off, he leans forward, produces rotation. As he takes off, he starts to tuck his body inwards. As he tucks his body inwards, his mass comes towards the transverse axis, and his angular velocity starts going up. And we have this threshold point, okay, where both are basically even. So he tucks as tight as he can here, as tight as he can, meaning he's spinning fast. He's now moving rapidly towards the water. So he increases his moment of inertia again by coming back into this straight out, now upside down, of course. He straightens out, about to enter the water, and his angular velocity comes back down, and he enters the water here where the angular momentum changes. There's the torque being applied. And he is now controlling going into the water straight. So, folks, a couple of things. First of all, do not forget that takeoff point. So many students forget that because they go, right, in the first phase, they do. No, the first phase is the takeoff. Sorry, I'm whacking the desk here. Secondly, I really want to stress to you as well um, that this would be brilliant for an analyzed question. Do you notice analyzers break things down into parts and explain them? Look, I've got four parts takeoff, the early stage, the tuck stage, the straighten out stage, there's four stages for you. You could go through and explain each one in turn and look out for that question. The rotating body will continue in a state of constant angular momentum until an external torque, in our case, the water, acts upon it. <gasps> Breath, James. Right, I need the quickest of break before we do sports psychology. Theories of aggression coming up. Ah, oh, folks, there's a generator buzzing really close to me. I hope it's not disturbing you. Theories of aggression, right. First of all, we need to be able to compare types of aggression. So let's just be clear what these are. When we talk about assertive behavior, we are talking about a forceful act. We are talking about something which is within rules. We are talking about something which crucially could be defined as, for example, a forceful tackle, but a completely fair tackle. This is what we mean by an assertive behavior or a drive, drive into the basket in basketball or something like that. Whereas an aggressive behavior, we are talking here about something which has, obviously th this here is the, in, is the intent to complete the skill, but an aggressive behavior, according to AQ, is an intent to harm. It's outside the rules. It's outside the rules. And crucially, uh, this would involve things like punching, kicking, striking, okay? But there's exceptions, right? Because a punch, 
which is a forceful act in boxing or MMA is within the rules. Okay, so there are variations. These things, these concepts do sort of merge here. And I'll just, um, I'll give you these sort of statements and we'll have a go at this. So what have we got here? We've got assertive behavior such as, what should we go for? Drive to basket, you know, in basketball where you sort of drive through players is a functional act. And what we mean by that is it's an act within the rules. Whereas aggressive behavior such as, punching an opponent punching an op has the intent to harm that's what we mean here okay aggressive behavior such as uh, a kick to i want to go for a referee my goodness kicks for a free involves breaking the rules but assertive behavior such as let's go for what do we have here forceful tackle is within the rules now guys can i you might sort of be interested in the words that i've written there but i don't think they're the interesting bit can i show you what i think is interesting about that comma space whereas but i have made comparative statements so we could make a pretty strong argument that that there would be worth one mark why because i've made a comparison this here would be worth one mark. Why? Because I've made a comparison. If I'd have just said a certain behavior, so it's just driving to the basket is functional, no mark. I've got to say, whereas aggressive behavior is so-and-so, right? I've got to make that comparison. And that is always the case with comparison. Now, what we're gonna do is we're gonna have a look at different uh, theories of aggression. Now, the instinct theory is kind of an interesting one. I've gone cold on this theory and there's elements. I've been reading a few things recently that have sort of brought it back to my attention. It doesn't matter for this uh, context, but I just thought I'd mention it. So it's a trait theory obviously link it to your personality theories. It's about biological drive, it's about survival, it's about the nature, uh, in this word here, it's about sort of human history, anthropological tool for survival. So we use aggression effectively so that one can eventually pass on one's genes and, you know, effectively provide offspring. Anyway, aggression is common in sport as it can be channeled in a socially acceptable way. That's interesting, right? So it's common in sport because it's acceptable to a degree. Aggression leads to cathartic, remember this is stress relief, stress relief and aggression is more common in men okay that's what this theory suggests i am not arguing that this theory is correct i'm just saying it's interesting what are the positives of the theory first of all aggression seems to be natural human need okay so it seems fairly consistent loads of exceptions by the way aggression can be hard to control why because maybe it's biological some people are consistently aggressive might suggest their personality aggression is predictable in some people personality you can feel a cathartic release of aggression when channeled through sport so you actually feel better if i go to the gym tonight and do a hit train including some combat and punching the bag or kneeing the bag i might get that kind of release right but it's, i guess that's sort of to some degree functional and stress relieving aggression now there are criticisms of this theory. what are they not all human beings show aggression not all cultures show aggression it's very simplistic it's very generalized aggression is not often spontaneous it's often provoked to respond to the environment if you retaliate someone that's that's um environmental isn't it uh, aggression is often learned or copied social learning bandura uh, people can learn not to be aggressive we can we can effectively condition people differently aggression can be shown by people at different times different environments environmental stimuli so the environment seems to play a part at least to some degree so let's take this th further what did bandura tell us and obviously we could look at bandura's numerous types of bandura's theory personality observational learning but let's look here at what he said about violence he argues it's learned through modeling and copying key words for you it can be taught or educated out we can detrain someone to be aggressive according to bandura and he emphasizes the roles of experience education and reinforcement in all of its forms both positive negative and punishment okay so what's positive about this well first of all explains how some people react differently in different situations beautiful explains why crossing the white line you know literally turning into someone else can be can bring on aggression or some people are like really pacifist in their lives and they go and they go on pitch court whatever and then you know <laughs> they get stuck in takes into account the influence of others including parents so one's background gives responsibility for aggression i, I love that point like it gives power and controllability you could you know gives controllability to coach performer parent that's great explains how some people can become, become less aggressive over time some would argue that's age or stage of life but anyway now then the negatives it does not take traits into account which is an interesting point it doesn't explain why different people react differently in the same situation okay so it's, if the situation is the same why do they do it differently each time does not consider which cues might cause aggression so we're going to look at cue hype uh, 
a, a aggressive cue hypothesis in a second, but it doesn't consider what stimuli cause aggression to be more likely in the environment. So let's take it further. We're going to look at frustration aggression hypothesis. Now let's just quickly look at the actual um, theory first. What are we saying? We are saying that what happens is that frustration we're saying that frustration develops when the obstacle to a goal is blocked so we have got blocked okay so we've got some kind of blockage we want something to happen we want to perform well we want to win our match we want to finish first but something there's an obstacle that's blocking that and what dollard said is that frustration always and this is his trait part of his theory leads to aggression so where frustration occurs aggression will occur Okay, so the question then we've got to ask is, did that aggression meet the desired impact? Okay, now often the desired impact is simply the release of aggression. Now, if the performer successfully releases that, releases that aggression, it will lead to catharsis and then they can get back on with what they're doing. However, often what we find, frustration will lead to aggression and it will become cyclical. So it will not be released. There will be no cathartic effect. And we might, therefore, get increased aggression. So, for example, I, I always use this example because I think it's a good one. Footballers, there's often handbags, isn't it? But footballers, one tackles the other one hard, the other one jumps up and is frustrated and shoves them. And the other one, that should release the aggression, right? That should be the success. They've got it out of themselves. It's cathartic. The other one shoves them back. So it's not successful. And it leads to a spiral of aggression, which could end in violence. Okay? Often doesn't. But that's the kind of example. But the point I want to make is trait, trait, sorry, that's not right. Trait, part, frustration, always aggression. And then here, it's environmental. Is it successful or not? Now, I'd like to change my canvas here. And I'm going to come, oh, sorry, I'm not going to change my canvas. We haven't done the evaluation. What's good about this theory? First of all, it's more realistic. <laughs> um, we can see it when someone gets frustrated. Catharsis does occur when frustration is released. That's good. We get this uh, frustration aggression link is a good one. There does seem to be a link between frustration and always aggression happening. It doesn't it come in different forms, of course, and it helps the coach to manage aggressive athletes. So if they can spot frustration, they can cause that release. However, frustration does not always lead to aggression. Let's be clear. Aggression can occur without any frustration. Sometimes we get pre-planned, deliberate aggression. Wow. Aggression can be socially learned. Unpunished aggression does not always lead to a catharsis. It doesn't take traits into account, and not everyone becomes frustrated when goal-directed behavior is blocked. So frustration itself might not occur. Now, there's our evaluation. I'm going to change my canvas, folks, and we're going to move on. Okay, folks, one last aggression theory to cover. I love this theory because it's a scapegoat theory. I love scapegoat theories, and this is a brilliant one. Now, I'll explain what I mean by that in a second, but let's have a look at it as follows. So, what have we got here? We've got an environmental cue. Can I just stress, an environmental cue could be something like an obstacle to a goal. So, it could be that we're in a sporting context or just in the sport and we experience arousal. Now, we all know arousal can be positive if it's, if it's at the optimal point, right? But perhaps what we're saying here is that once a person's aroused with the possibility of going over-aroused, the deciding factor of whether aggression is going to occur or not comes from whether an aggressive cue is present or not. Now, the way I personally like to think about this is, if you're angry at home, and by the way, this is going to I mean, I'm using an old-fashioned saying here of kick the cat. Please, no, I do never, ever kick a cat. But you can't kick the cat if the cat isn't there, can you? You kick something else. You, you... I feel bad about that now. <laughs> that was a terrible example. It's a, it's from the saying. You know, anyway, my, my point is that if there is no ob aggressive object or object that one can perform aggression with or on, then then no aggression can occur. Whereas if it is aggression can happen or the increased tendency for aggression so let's just have a look at what we mean by that we're saying that aggressive cues can be weapons objects nature of the game places people nature of the end, perceived unfairness witnessing violence so it might be perceived unfairness the aggressive cue is that we, we, we we've had a video official decision that's gone against us even though we thought it's going to go for us it could be that we think the referee has got something wrong and that cue leads to an aggressive behavior or more likely or more relevantly increased tendency for aggression 
Whereas if the, what our perceived incorrect decision was not present, we're far less likely. Think about the game of hockey or hurling in Ireland. So if you've got a hockey stick in your hand, it increases the tendency or it increases the possibility that throwing or hitting with or striking or throwing to the ground the hockey stick you can't do it without that right so we take it out on the hockey stick we throw we hit a bad shot in golf and we throw our driver into the into the uh, the rough on the to the side of us we get frustrated we take it out on the golf club this cuz that cue is there what's positive about this it shows how environmental influences play a role aggressive cues can be very personal and explains why frustration doesn't always lead to aggression brilliant however Aggression does not always occur in the presence of aggressive cue. And I think that's a harsh criticism because it's just increased likely a tendency. Aggressive cues can be very different, specific, meaning the theory is very complex and doesn't take traits into account. Okay, so there's our theory, our scapegoat theory. Sorry about the cat reference. I feel guilty about that. Never kicked a cat in my life, obviously. You shouldn't have to explain that, should you? Anyway, how do we control aggression? So coaches, we look to reinforce non-aggressive non role models. That could be through praise and incentivization. We talk to the performer during Blake's play. We help them to de-escalate things. We use thought stopping. This is the other side of positive self-talk, of course. We use mental rehearsal imagery to visualize positive states. We use stress management, such as mindfulness, deep breathing, centering. We give responsibility like captain, captainship or key roles in a performance to someone who might be more likely to be aggressive. We punish when it happens. And if we see it coming, folks, we take them out of the situation. We substitute. So if we see aggression escalating, we take them out of that situation. That's what we do. Now, here we go, Tuckman's model of group dynamics. We are interested here in how groups are formed, okay? So we're not going to do uh, McClelland and Atkinson, achievement goal theory, achievement motivation. We're not doing social facilitation. We're skipping to group dynamics. So here we've got a definition for ourselves. Collection of people who share similar goals and interact one one another. But we're interested in how those groups actually form. And for that, we use Tuckman's model. Now, I'm going to detail this out for you and write it all out for you. So first of all, I'm interested in the forming, storming, norm and forming stage. And I should stress, I'm, I'm never respectful. <laughs> I'm not as respectful of any theory that's deliberately arriving. I mean, come on. Um, but anyway, what is the forming stage? This is the initial, but also short or temporary stage. So this is when the group first comes together. It involves lots and lots of fitting in. You know, you come to a basketball club for the first time, you try and fit in. What people are doing in that environment is an assessment of strength. So if a new performer comes into a club, people will look at them, see what they've got to offer, right? We imagine that. We get the first examples of interpersonal relationships. So people might start chatting, get to know each other. Hey, what's your name? Hey, where are you from? Where'd you play before? Da -da -da -da. And we get some elements of bonding. That's what we mean in that early stages. And of course, a coach can use that by putting in things like bonding activities, right? Now, we then have the storming. Now, annoyingly, this is where conflict and hostility start to manifest themselves. Often because this is a competitive environment, right? So we get conflict and hostility. We get jostling, jostling, like wriggling for your position in the, in the group. It's decision makings, decision making worsens, decision making gets worse because there's no kind of power dynamic yet. We work in different ways. The performers work in different ways. Okay, so there's not uh, there's no alignment at this point. And what do we really need? We need a leader. Okay, we need a leader. So we're looking for. I'm holding out for a hero. Who's that, Bonnie Tyler? We need a <laughs> we need a leader because if we don't, what happens? We get the formation of cliques which are little subgroups and we get the appearance of what we call isolates these are people who are all by themselves and not taking part with the group oh dear now at that point we lose participants because of course we've got these cliques these isolates not everyone feels part of this so what we now go is into the norming stage and here in the norming stage we start to see agreement developing wonderful conflicts resolved fantastic so we're now getting increased understanding between the group we're getting on so performers are getting on wonderful isn't that good we get a common goal at this stage everyone's working towards the same thing we get commitment from our participants people become committed to this to the cause and we get respect and critically we get respect for the leader the leader's position becomes a respected one now 
to finish this off we're going to have a look at performing this is the last stage and we should stress here this performing ultimately refers to best performance or maximum productivity we're going to look at that with steiner in a second okay but crucially we get up arrow increased role awareness people know what their role is in the group it could be that someone becomes a social secretary for example we get increase in intuition even on a technical level teammates seem to know what the other person is going to do we get an up arrow an increase in understanding of one another you know we might accept a mistake and help someone to correct it for example and we work towards our common goal in order to achieve best performance those are the stages of Tuckman's model of group dynamics it's a shame he chose to make them rhyme anyway let's move further ringelman effect and social loafing let's look at steiner's model first of all steiner's model tells us that if we take any team if we take any group whether this is a rugby team an athletics team whatever it happens to be a, a lawn bowling team that i can't wait to be a member of when i'm older um there's a team and a group here and they have an actual productivity this is actually what they do this is what they do so this is going to be winning some matches losing performing at this level that that's what they do but what is that a product of or what is that a sum of that is a sum of all of the capacity of the members or the strengths of all the members put together but we must also take away errors faulty processes and that is where our ringelman and social loafing come in so first of all what is social loafing well first of all folks it is an error it is a faulty process and it is a lack of motivation it's performers being lazy or hiding when they're lost in a team how do we reduce social loafing well we set high standards we set individual goals we monitor performance with trackers notational analysis by the way notational analysis is if i was watching let's say you were watching me in football training you would say right james has done one sprint two sprints three sprints four five six uh, he's performed one two headers whatever whatever you note down these things you punishment you punish a lack of motivation and this is a really interesting one. we didn't we don't study drive reduction theory but this is all about resetting goals because if someone's goal has been achieved the new goal has to be set otherwise they lose motivation and they're not as interested anymore i always think of tyson fury that one beat klitschko in whatever that was set 2017 i want to say and then put on what was it 20 stone because his goal had been achieved sit my teeth i'm sure there were other factors as well you know some of his behaviors some of the treatments some mental health issues as well um but you see that that goal needed to be reset and i think obviously he's a good example of how that's been done well now the ringelman effect still don't know who that person is is different these are technical coordination losses this means we make mistakes in our performances happens a lot in larger teams so more likely in rugby union than rugby league than basketball for example and it's more co it's more common where lots of perception is needed okay so complex skills how do we how do we do it better team and individual goals we practice like the competition we can call that by the way near transfer we develop teams within teams think about um, attacking teams defensive teams set plays hockey teams having a defensive corner um, set up we overlearn set plays we select the team not on the best players but on the most cohesive players we use analysis and video playback and we reinforce successes so those are the key factors of how we reduce social loaf and reduce the ringelman effect what they are and how it affects overall productivity now guys to finish off on our sports psychology section i'm slightly worried about time here but let's keep going i want to look specifically at leadership styles you've heard me talk about leadership a couple of times already we're not going to go and do uh, shaladjari here we're just going to talk about styles of leadership um, but this is what I really want to get across to you folks. First things first, we're going to describe there being three styles of leadership. We're interested in autocracy, we're interested in democracy, and we're interested in laissez-faire style. So I'm actually also going to sort of put a continuum. I'm just going to put it of involvement or decisions. And in fact, actually, I've drawn it the wrong way. This is where... There would be much involvement and many decisions and few and this is from the leader so let's have a look an autocratic leader is task orientated tends to be dictatorial they make all the decisions as we've said here they have a direct approach they get the job done and they don't consult with others so this is not a group-based decision making they make the decisions now in the laissez-faire which is at the other extreme they do the exact opposite they go for little support or input to the group they let the team members get on with it 
They let things happen. They stand aside. Can you see how that's the opposite of autocracy? Democracy is not the opposite of autocracy. And we'll come to evaluation in a second. But democracy is the following. Very thoughtful, person-oriented leadership. We build relationships. We share decision-making. We consult with members. We share responsibility. That brings people into the group. Now, there's something called Fiedler's Contingency Model, which basically says... This is the best way to do things if the situation is really favourable and positive or really unfavourable and negative. And this is the one to do if it's sort of moderately favourable. I'm not going to get into that here. But there's the point I would make here that we, we need adaptability of leaders. Adaptability. And leaders do not need to perform one of only of these need to perform them all at different times for different circumstances that's what shall i drive's models all about but anyway we need to evaluate so what's good about autocracy brilliant with groups clarity confidence for the leader gets conformity if i'm teaching javelin i'm doing it trust me good for beginners if there's not much time you know imagine a, a PE teacher having to get all the gym equipment away in two minutes at the end they're not going to be they're not going to say how do you feel about it? no they're going to tell you what to do um, good if the leader is authoritarian good when the leaders are young male leader potentially and it's there's some evidence that males prefer autocracy and finally if the group prefers autocracy of course then it's going to be positive you can almost make the same point of democracy in, in the inverse it's good if the group is friendly it develops ownership between the members it's good if there's time it develops wider ideas and opinions not just the leaders it's good for an experienced group it's good if the group's preferred behavior is democratic female leaders often prefer democracy but female recipients of leadership often prefer democracy this is a generalization of course good when learners are older or experienced now when would we do this let's say first standing aside let them get on with it never right well hang on a second we would do it in specific situations what about some team building and outdoor adventure i have done this style lots and lots and lots when i've been team building type environments i sometimes set up uh, fake team building environments in schools like cross the acid river jump the electric fence and you introduce a bit like whole learning you introduce the challenge and then you step back and allow them to become the leaders but when wouldn't you do this? Well, it provides a lack of direction, guidance, and people give up. You absolutely must not do this in dangerous situations, okay? So when it comes to, oh, yeah, you put your rock climbing harness on yourself, even if you're not sure. Or don't worry about the figure of eight, not you do it how you want. No, <laughs> that's going to be done with uh, autocracy. Okay, we are moving on. I'm going to take the briefest the pause as we move into sports sighting technology. Uh, just bear with me a second. So a really interesting and key term, I think we are, uh, about ethics as well. So notice I've sort of jumped past all the stuff on um, elite development. I've jumped past all the stuff on uh, sport, physical recreation, all that kind of stuff. And we're into ethics here, okay? Now, if you want to cover that, that stuff, I did actually cover a bunch of that in my 2022 revision. It's on YouTube. Go find it. Now, section 11, ethics in sport. Key terms. We want to be understanding amateurism. What are we referring to, folks? So historical context first. Amateurism developed in the upper classes in the Victorian era. And when we talk about the upper classes, we are talking specifically about the upper and the brand new at this stage middle class, which of course had emerged from the Industrial Revolution type conditions, the suburban environments, those, art, those artisan um, uh, business cottage industries that developed into larger industries as a result. That's where this principle came from. And it was historically adhered to a high set of moral values as the upper and middle classes could afford to play sport. So sport was played as a moral code. It was even seen as in the image of God. Okay, that's what this was referred to. That's the traditional nature. So it saw participation as much more important than winning. So it had what we could tag a participation ethic, not what we see a lot of today, which is a win ethic. Talents were God-given. Bear in mind this meant for many people training was cheating at this point. Never mind peds and whatever else. Amateurs in the 19th century were the elite. Those that you had to be able to afford to be amateur. Let's put it that way. And modern day is still seen in traditional notion, or current notions of fair play. Although we could argue that fair play is dwindling, dwindling in the, in the, in the presence of commerciality. And participation in sport for the love of it no financial gain so a lot of what people do when, when people write about amateurs they say things like don't get paid yeah i agree can you see it's way more than that 
It's an ethos. It's an approach. Now, where we're going to go next in our next term is the Olympic Oath. Now, here we go. This was written by pa Baron Pierre de Corbetin, founder of the Model Olympic Games. For this, and by the way, this, first, this oath was first taken in 1920. So it, it, it's... Um, you know, it's relatively recent. It's a, it's not the ancient version. It's a promise made um, by athletes, and it's still it, it's still encouraged today, as because there's no appearance fees or anything like that. And it also says how deviant behaviour uh, will be uh, will be seen. So let's have a look. We promise to take part, participate in these Olympic Games, respecting and abiding by the rules in the spirit of fair play, inclusion and equality. Together we stand in solidarity and commit ourselves to sport without doping, without cheating, without any form of discrimination. We do this for the honour of our teams and respect for the fundamental principles of Olympism and to make the world a better place through sport. Now, folks, if that happened more, that would be brilliant, wouldn't it? But we've got to step back and say, well, has there been any doping? What about commercialism? Uh, can we just maybe ask the Olympic Committee why they have, let's say, McDonald's as, a, as an investment partner? Uh, what about gamesmanship? So can we argue that today this principle has been diluted, watered down? Are there examples of that? Um, we've also got today professional athletes taking part in the Olympics. Think golfers, footballers, this kind of thing. And we see a lot the win at all costs ethos which is you will do anything to win that medal so we have got a conflict i think i'd say it fair to say in the modern world now we're going to take things further we're now interested in the notion of sportsmanship which you'll see very closely linked to that olympic uh, ethos right what are we talking about with sportsmanship fairness folks we're talking about a high code of ethics it comes out of that amateurism sort of uh, concept right maintaining self-control treating others fairly etiquette which is playing by the unwritten rules as well respecting officials and opponents kicking the ball out of play for an injury walking and cricket went out conforming to the rules spirit etiquette of the sport and the unwritten rules so that's what we mean by sportsmanship and i think it's fair to say that we all like it when we see it but what if we're supporting our team and it, and someone's sportsmanship means less chance to win a league or cut up a trophy or whatever do we support that what's your ethical code what's your moral perspective how does that integrate with the highly commercial world of modern sport? Never mind your exam. How do you feel about that? What do you believe? And I think those are really exciting things to perhaps consider. Okay, let's take things further. Gamesmanship. By the way, this is currently the accepted term. It is not currently called gamespersonship. Hence me choosing gamesmanship here. Um, let's see what happens. Using whatever method to achieve a desired result. Okay, now... We should say within the rules. Gamesmanship is not deviant. It's within rules. It's a very fine line with che very fine line with cheating. So we've got a line here. Cheating is here, and gamesmanship. I was going to put GMS is there. It's a very fine line between those two principles. But it is. We fail to follow the etiquette. We might use sledging, which is using verbal insults or, or, or jokes with our opponent. We might waste or delay time. We might do deliberate deception. We might bend the rules and stretch them to the absolute limit without getting caught. We do everything to gain, get ready for this, a, air quotes, fair advantage. Now, it's only the positioning of the rules that make it fair. You take the rules to their maximum, and therefore, in air quotes, you get a fair advantage. Oh, this upsets me, but I'm just going to go with it. For me, the win ethic and the win at all cost mentality are very, very different. I just want to stress that before we get into that, and I'm going to I'm going to ignore my own principles and just go with this. So, um, what is the win ethic? Often uh, linked to what's called Lombardism, more of which in a second. Uh, it's second place is not an option. Second place is losing, folks. That's what win ethic means. And it was developed, or it's often attributed to uh, a coach called Vince Lombardi. Uh, who was a coach of a very kind of unfancied American football team, the Green Bay Packers in the 60s and 70s, and they had incredible success. And they did it through what we'd all recognize there as very modern winning-based uh, uh, preparations, tactics, and provisions. You see it a lot in modern-day sport. It's the idea that draws are pointless and no good. Managers are sacked if unsuccessful. You'll follow sports where that's the case. There's potential for deviance because pressure is high on the winning and the outcome. There's huge praise for winners and losers are just losers. And it can spill over 
into the win at all costs mentality. Win at all costs is you will literally do anything like doping, violent, cheating. Like that, that's a different concept, but it can spill over. That's what we mean by the win ethic. Now, I've got to change my canvas, folks, and I'm on my last canvas of the day. We are almost there. Folks, we are so close. Section 12, 12 sections we've done here. My God. Okay, effects of drugs on the performer. Now, there are other aspects of the drugs topic, but we're going to focus on this one. We're looking at the physiological or physical effects of the drug on both the performer and, crucially, their performance. Now, I don't know if they'll ask you one of these or the other, either this or this, but we should probably be prepared for that. Um, let's take these in turn. We're going to look at R, we're going to look at EPO, sometimes known as R-H-E-P-O. Okay, this is erythropoietin. By the way, erythropoiesis is the biological process of the production of red blood cells in the bone marrow. So if you're doing A-level biology, you'll know all about this. But anyway, what is EPO? It's a naturally occurring hormone, of course, that's amino acids based protein uh, produced by the kidneys. We can take synthetic EPO and it can be man manufactured and injected. Now, again, erythropoiesis, it causes a growth in red blood cell count. So why is this positive? Well, it's all that aerobic stuff, isn't it? Increased red blood cell count, that means increased hematocrit. Remember, hematocrit, hematocrit, is the proportion of the blood, which is uh, blood cells and plasma. So if we've got more uh, red blood cells, of course, that boosts that, that hematocrit. Increased hemoglobin levels, increased oxygen carry capacity, increased aerobic capacity. I love this. I drill this sentence into my own students. Work aerobically at higher intensities, meaning we delay obla, we recover faster, better adaptations and we peak okay brilliant however there's problems first of all can i just say it's outright cheating let's be clear um but the, otherwise it increases our blood viscosity and can lead to blood clots and it can lead to a higher risk of stroke okay so there have been some horror stories where this might be the case ne never necessarily proven um but it's something to, to be aware of now then we're going to look at anabolic steroids remind yourself that anabolic steroids are testosterone based Okay, it's often synthetic again, but they're testosterone based, that male hormone. Okay, it's an artificial produced hormone. Again, those amino acids, those proteins. E example THG, which I won't write out, but it's called tet tetrahydrogestrinone. Oh my God, it's hard to say that. Is an excellent example of a high profile synthetic band steroid. This was actually produced by what's called the Balco scandal at the bay area laboratory company scandal if you if you want to there's some great footage online if you want to go and find out more about that i won't cover it here but it was produced for that um by those specialists and became very popular now then why would people use anabolic steroids well first of all it aids in the storage of protein brilliant you guys know what proteins are for they go to the ribosomes that um, amino acids that you uh, they, they form human proteins in protein synthesis anyway Muscle growth is one of the purposes. We get more muscle tissue, more strength, more power, less fat in the muscle. It's leaner. Leaner body weight. Train at higher intensity for longer and a decreased fatigue with training. But as a problem, it can make serious implications for the limit damage. And the reason this is, is athletes take massive doses. So be reassured, if you go into the doctor for... Uh, by the way, acne is often treated with... Um, steroids okay so you you your teenager could very possible you would be using that ac uh, acne steroids at the moment like i used to for example when i was a kid um you're taking tiny dosages a, a, a compared to this these are enormous heart and immune system problems acne there you go uh, that one there actually can cause it anyway i'm not going to get into that uh behavior changes we get roid rage aggression mood swings ugh, grotty and then, of course, we've also got these beta blockers. Now, it's kind of an interesting drug. Can I say this? By the way, this is completely banned. This is completely banned. <laughs> okay? This is only partially banned. There's lots of sports where you're allowed to take beta blockers. I mean, I don't know why you would, as you'll see in a second, but you can. So, this is banned in sports like archery, pistol shooting, this kind of stuff. Snooker. has a calming effect. It decreases anxiety. It actually literally blocks adrenaline receptors, so your adrenaline doesn't take hold. Um, there you go. And it prevents adrenaline binding with nerve receptors. So therefore, we've got a steady hand, we're calm, etc. So therefore, we're more accurate, steady nerves, our heart rate is low, our hand does not tremble, our arteries widen, decreased resistance to blood flow means more cardiac output gets where it needs to be, reduced involuntary muscle spasms, as in, as in shaking. However, <laughs> it sends you to sleep. Lower blood pressure, and slower heart rate will affect aerobics. So obviously, if you're a 
marathon and you ain't doing this and therefore it's not banned for that so that's what those do now i think this is our last section folks we're now looking at data collection everyone's favorite right so what i've done here is i produced a new image for this because i just wanted to get a bit of consistency i suppose data collection is studying data from sports performance to try and improve performance so we're looking at improving performance folks right so just key points we have got quantitative research what does that produce for us it produces formal objective numerical data such as numbers and it's a systematic process so for example if we were to do a vo2 max ramp test using an oxygen mask we would be lit uh, using a mask and measurements on a computer we would literally be measuring and producing quantitative research what does it tend to provide it tends to provide measurable observable meaningful for decision making feedback based information based on facts in other words folks it's numbers which we can act upon however qualitative research i hate saying that word it's different right it's feelings and opinions it's less precise it can be less meaningful it also can be more meaningful depending on what you're looking for it takes blinking ages the data gathered to prove a hypothesis so we tend to do interviews with people to ask opinions this sort of thing work we focus on words not numbers and it's subjective meaning open-ended questioning now this kind of data it tends to lead to the following it tends to lead to information based on assumptions uh, opinions assumptions interpretations emotions and beliefs less meaningful in the feedback um, process except that it is an opinion can i stress that the coaches i then watching you and giving you feedback that is qualitative isn't it it's an observation okay so it is not objective so we talked earlier about whether it's effective or not whether it, yeah anyway so there we go so that's what we mean and we tend to get quality um, research leading to subjective data now to finish off this i want to just make sure you understand the difference between validity and reliability now you could apply this to anything you could apply this to fitness tests for example so validity what is it it's the degree to which data collected actually measures what it claims to measure is it claiming the thing it says it claims uh, the hand grip dynamometer test tests strength no it tests static strength of the forearm muscles of one arm okay that would be valid does the does the data collected measure exactly what it sets out to do good question that's validity now reliability is different is it the data collected in a consistent way do we get similar results if we do it again and again on a later date now obviously some things would change and fitness could be one of them is the same researcher placing results into the same categories on different occasions okay so if we get um a set of results and we just interpret them differently that's less reliable the different researchers place results in the same or similar categories okay can be affected by human error and it's poorly maintained and non-calibrated equipment so non-calibrated equipment okay now, funnily enough i can notice that my pen tip so even though that's making a dot there and there my pen tip is actually not at that point so i need to calibrate and i swear my goodness folks i can't quite believe we've done the whole session i think we're over time i seriously need to lie down it's three hours of delivery for me <sighs> almost time to lie down yes you yeah you <clears throat> deserve that james yes <laughs> yes I, I i feel a few chocolate peanuts coming on oh tempting big night big night him Right, so let's uh, let's crack on with a few questions that have arrived during the session, mm -hmm. and then we can all head home. Brilliant. Right, so first question, James. Mm -hmm. Is it worth recapping the paper one topics for the second paper? As in paper one, one of the 15 markers makes mixed arousal. Definitely. And where white is small. Definitely. And listen, I just want to remind you, uh, AQA students, this is important, okay? You're, you're going to get three synoptic questions across the 12 essays you're going to do that's the the 615s and the 68s right you're going to get three synoptic essays and although that that one seems like quite an obvious synoptic one arousal information processing writing that's from skill into psychology right but just remember it's absolutely reasonable for aqa to ask you cross-disciplinary synoptic questions as well now they tended not to do that in the past there's absolutely no reason why they can't so yes i do believe it's worthwhile knowing those um, paper one topics. I think the big advantage in paper two, of course, is you have done paper one and you've done all that prep, you've done all that work, you've done all that revision. Okay, maybe it's starting to dip in terms of your familiarity. 
but it's still going to be sharp when you come into this exam. Should you read through it one more time? Absolutely. And if you're interested, if you go to our blog, I've blogged about this twice in the last three weeks, uh, including all of the previous themes of which questions have been asked, what combinations. So if you want to get more detail on that and also my free to download writing frame for eight and 15 markers that's available from those blog post teachers you can distribute to the kids if you need to um kids sorry i'll rephrase that as young adult students uh sorry guys there you go marta next question fantastic can i just have the microphone a bit closer just because it sounds yeah. like i'm asking the questions from tim book two okay one second have um, i got it on the wrong right? no i'm not right yeah, setting yeah, it just, I'll put it it just sounds quite quite far away right uh, right. Let me just so, turn the gain up, that's probably why. Okay, that should work better. So, how many marks would you think I would require out of the two papers, which amount to 210 marks, in order to get an A star? Would it be around 150 marks in total from both? Oof, that re so, thank you for the question, that person. That really depends on what you've already accrued and probably not confirmed in terms of moderation yet on your practical and your coursework you know and your non assessed uh, uh, on your on your NEA your non exam assessment so it would what was the number you just gave out of 210 sorry sorry what did they say they were aiming for sorry 210 uh, 150 that would be a phenomenal score i mean that would give you an exceptional opportunity to to do that so um if you're aiming for that then high fives all day long um that would give you an excellent opportunity i can't guarantee it because if the papers are very accessible and mark and, and raw mark performance by students is high this year, then you never know. But what 150 from 210 would be very, very, very positive, if I could put it that way. I just, I'm not in a position that I can tell you what grade that would occur. I'm so sorry. Um, I have a feeling it would certainly be at the upper end and would probably start with an A, but I can't because I don't know your, your NEA assessment, so I can't guess that, I'm afraid. I hope, I hope that's reasonable because, of course, mm -hmm. you've got another 90 marks that I don't know what that is. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. And why does angular velocity have to be low during the takeoff? Okay, good good question. Do we know the name person who asked that question? No. Okay, well, first of all, good, I'm assuming it's a student. Good, good question, young person. Um, so the key is just the intuition of this. Do you remember in your biomechanics, if you if you do a, a vector diagram of a 100-meter of sprinter right at the start of the race, what does their air resistance look like? Because you think of a sprinter, they're going fast, but in that first five meters, they're going super slow, so their air resistance is little, right? Tiny little arrow backwards, right? Well, we could say the same, really, for a diver as they start to dive. Angular velocity is rotational speed, right? And how fast are they rotating at the very takeoff? Very, very little. They're sort of leaning forward and starting to arc. That means, in fact, they tend to jump first, actually. So that means their actual turning velocity, their angular velocity is very low. But the only way that that can switch to being very high when they tuck in is if they've set their moment of inertia high, because, of course, those two values are inversely proportionate to one another. Why? Because of the law of conservation of angular momentum. Angular momentum will be conserved until um, during flight or on ice until an external torque acts, in this case, hitting the water with the hands and the head and that sort of thing. And, it and by the way, water does, it, when they enter the water, next time you watch high diving, Tom Daly and that, n next time you watch that, notice that when they enter the water, they keep rotating for a bit. So the external torque is not sufficient to overcome all of that angular, angular momentum. It is reduced. They keep rotating forward. Have a look next time. I guarantee you the vast majority of divers do a little mini somersault as soon as they enter the water. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, sorry, the, the, it was the question. I don't have their first name, but I know it is a student from K uh, King Edward the Sixth School. So Brilliant. a little shout out for students at King, King Edward the Sixth School. <laughs> the best king. I, I don't know anything about King Edward the Sixth. He might have been a nightmare. I have no idea. Um, I've got um, um, one question that just come in. If we've got time. Yeah, of course. So the question is: Got any questions about you? Oh, sorry. Hold on. No, that. <laughs> That's the oh, question. That? Considering there was a 15 marker on leadership last year, what's the likelihood this will come up again? Um, hang on. Let me do something. Um, Marta, just just fill for me a second. I'm gonna I'm gonna answer that with numbers. I didn't have this document open, so I'm just gonna I'm just gonna open it. Um, I'm gonna answer that with I, all I can give is an opinion on that, folks. Right, that's really all I can do. Mm -hmm. So just bear with me a second while I open up what we might consider evidence rather than opinion and then we can talk about that opinion and perhaps okay so just bear in mind i'm just setting up the shot this was not to plan thank you for the question that person screen capture that's what we want we want that i want to add my microphone to it there we go this is all this live streaming they don't have, you never heard about this stuff on bbc do you um let's just configure that that is a window that is going to be on two 
uh, that there. You're okay. doing well, James. You're I know, I'm well. doing well. I was right. going to ask if you wanted to sing a little bit to keep me. Okay. Folks I'm, folks, I'm so sorry. That's working, right? That's working out. I'm so sorry, folks. I messed that up. Anyway, what I was showing here is just the history If we, of the questions. If we look at characteristics of effective leaders, it's never been assessed. Does that mean it's more or less? I don't know. I mean, it's, wor it's worth knowing, though. Uh, if we go into other areas here, if we go into, for example, uh, styles of leadership, that has not been assessed since 2018, so really worthwhile uh, being aware of that and previous been, it's been uh, described and explained, so two commands in that question. If we go into a different leadership topic, let's go into, bear with me a second, let's go into, uh, <laughs> this was not planned. If we go into prescribed and emergent, never assessed. And if we go into, bum, 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 I think we've got one left. If we go into uh, Fiedler, assessed once for one mark. And if we go into Shaladjurai, uh, here we go. If we go into Shaladjurai, uh, assessed as a 15 marker last year. So I guess what we would say about that is that speaking purely from the perspective of probability, nothing else, we could certainly expect a leadership question but perhaps it's less likely to be on Shaladjurai, more on styles of leadership, emergent and prescribed characteristics of effective leadership. Now, AQA are well within their rights to put Shaladjurai on twice con consecutively, right? That's a completely reasonable thing to do. Um, but that data would tend to suggest that some of those other areas, maybe. And all I can say is that data is objective. It's quantitative, of course, we just did that. Um, so I, if I can answer it that way, I really don't like predicting exam papers, folks. I do not do that full stop, including with my own students, including with my own children. My elder daughter is doing OCRI level. I do not predict exams for her either. So it's a bit of a mugs game, that one. Um, and it, it, I would, if I did that, I would consider myself a bit unprofessional. So all I, all I can do is share the data with you and say, mm, maybe on other areas of leadership. That, I guess that's the best answer I can give, Marta. Mm -hmm. I know no one wants to hear this. I want to say it anyway, if you go in underprepared on any topic, it's going to catch you out. As simple as that. But you, right, I'm going motivation route here, right? So I'm not, I'm not your family member, I'm not your teacher, I'm just some geezer on the internet, right? And you can ignore me, that's fine. But you do owe it to yourself to know everything going into that exam. So make that happen. Because you will kick yourself if you don't, all right? So if you value yourself and you value your qualification and you value your own efforts, Make sure you're ready. Um, that would be my advice. And I'm sorry if that comes across as sort of a bit daddish, but I think it's fair. So there you go. Mm -hmm. Any other okay. questions, Marty? No, no more questions. My goodness me! I'm gonna quickly time check. For oh man! I'm gonna quickly uh, check Twitter. Um, we have got a question from Isaac Fryer actually oh, about uh, he, uh, Isaac didn't realise that there was a session tonight. So yeah, Isaac, and if you're gonna find this or not, I sent it to you on Twitter just a moment ago. Brill, Marta, are you happy? I am happy. Are we playing out, as it were? Yes. Good stuff. Folks, last time we're going to see you, AQA level students. Go get it, huh? Go get them and, and all the best. Thank you so much. Oh, one thing I will share before we go. This is not a direct, this is not a reliable number, but there's about 4,500 students doing AQA level PE, right? And our paper one uh, revision was viewed over 10,000 times, including by multiple groups of students in classrooms. Uh, we were delighted with that, and the average view was well over 35 minutes. So that would suggest to us that a lot of people have engaged with that se that yeah, paper one session. So thank you. Yes, thank we you. really, really, really appreciate it, and fair play to you for doing that. Thank you for valuing us. We value you, and hopefully it makes a difference. So um, we, we answer every comment on YouTube. Reach out. We'll answer it for you. Uh, we're on social as well. Go and get us on there and we will answer your questions. Uh, teachers always feel free, feel free to fire questions my way and uh, I appreciate you guys a lot. Okay, yep. all good? Yep. Have a great evening, folks. I'm having a big rest. Cheers. <laughs> Bye.